Hi everyone, it's Stephanie with The Patient Story and I'm thrilled to be able to have this conversation that we're gonna have today um, with, with two wonderful gentlemen. First, Dr. Chris Waite, the uh, director at the Center for Urologic Oncology at Cleveland Clinic, um, someone we've had the pleasure of speaking with before, and um, one of his patients, Jeff, um, who's here to share his prostate cancer story. So welcome to the both of you. And um, I, I thought we would kick it off with um, an introduction. So first we'll, we'll talk to Dr. Waite, if you could just tell us a little bit about yourself and your work. Great, thank you, Stephanie. We're happy to, I'm happy to be here and happy that Jeff joined us. I think um, patient stories are a really important part of understanding uh, cancer care. And today we're talking about prostate cancer. Uh, I, as Stephanie said, I'm the center director for urologic oncology at Cleveland Clinic. And I take care of patients with prostate cancer, bladder cancer, kidney cancer are the three primary cancers and also some other more rare cancers. Um, and, and I have a personal connection to prostate cancer in particular because my dad had prostate cancer while I was in the midst of my surgical training. So it really influenced the way I think about taking care of patients and, and understanding what maybe more what it feels like to be on the family side of a cancer experience. Wow, thank you so much for sharing that. That's incredibly powerful that you're driven not just by your intellectual curiosities um, and ambitions, but that you have such a personal tie. Um, so thank you for sharing that, Dr. Waite. We're gonna now get introduced to Jeff, um, one of Dr. Waite's patients. Um, Jeff would love to learn more about you. Okay, uh, hello everyone. Thanks again to Stephanie for the invitation. Uh, I am again, Jeff Presley. I'm a retired federal government employee, uh, retired from the federal government from 38, 38 and a half years of service. I uh, worked for the agency, uh, Defense Finance and Accounting Service, where I was working in the finance arena and paying people, civilian and military people. So, um, and I've been here in Cleveland for about 13 years and um, thank you, Dr. Waite, for uh, your assistance in uh, this process here, yeah. Wonderful. And, and, you know, today's conversation is going to be about, you know, really the decision making process and the patient doctor relationship. So really excited to have that. I'd love to start with you, Jeff, um, to talk about. Yeah. So I know that you got your first PSA test many years ago. Um, and then at some point, it got for, it got to go from your primary care doctor to a urologist and then shifted over to Dr. Waite. Can you talk about the shift from your urologist to Dr. Waite and how you were able to find him? Okay, yes. Um, 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 first, it started off with my primary uh, care physician. Um, back in 2007 or 2008, when I first began with him, um, my members began to inch up little by little. And so when it started to go over like one or two, I've sent him a, a mail stitch and said, hey, should I be concerned about my numbers increasing? He said, oh no, no, don't worry about it just yet. We will continue to look at it a year from now and if it continues, and it did. And so finally, uh, he referred me over to a urologist. And at that particular point in time, we did um, a PSA test. And then from there, we went to a biopsy and that type of thing. And then from that, uh, the biopsy revealed I think there are two or three of those revealed that each test came back was negative. And then finally, uh, he called and says, you know, we've done PSA tests. I think we need to move forward to see if we can take a more aggressive testing, ISO, P PSA. He said that test will usually determine if you have cancer or not. And so we did. And so we got the results back. He says, hey, we've seen something in there that maybe we need to have a closer look. And so I'm going to refer you over to Dr. Christopher uh, wait and have him do an MRI PSA. And so we did the MRI and then we did the MRI P, um, biopsy and then Dr. Wait um, revealed what, what I have today was prostate cancer. Thank you for walking us through that. That was really, that was really great. That was very succinct. And I, I hear that you had a lot of monitoring go on for many years. Um, Dr. Wade, I actually want to jump in and ask you this question. How important, I mean, we know there's primary care is the first point of contact for a lot of patients. How important is it? Um, and at what point should people be considering going to a specialist first, maybe a urologist, and then to someone like you who specializes in, in oncology? Prostate cancer screening um, has taken a little bit of a battering over the years. Uh, you know, 10 years ago, I think maybe we were overdoing the screening, doing it too often, too frequently, getting too excited about the results. Um, and that led to a period of time 
where we certainly reduced the risk of dying from prostate cancer nationwide, but at the same time, we, we diagnosed and overdiagnosed a lot of people. And, and so now there has been some revision in the way we do screening. Um, and, and there may be a lot, a lot of confusion among the primary care doctors who have to focus on a lot. And, and I don't envy them one bit. They have a lot to focus on. And, and cancer screening is one portion of what they're focused on. Um, but they may not be apprised of the most current guidelines and the nuances of how to appropriately screen. Because in an ideal screening situation, we identify those who are at risk and send them on to get further testing but leave those who are not at, at risk alone and don't get into a situation where you have a lot of people being um, over-tested and over-diagnosed. And so it's a tricky balance. It's based on somewhat on your PSA level, which is a blood test that many men know about and have had drawn, but it's also based a little bit on your exam, on your family history, on your ethnicity. And, and so I, I would recommend that uh, that you have a conversation with your primary care doctor. If, the, if they start to be uh, unable to answer some of these questions, you know, should I do it more often because of this family history, then that might be a good trigger to, to at least go to a urologist who has a little bit more experience with this and, and uh, finding the appropriate trigger point for getting additional testing. Uh, and, you know, Jeff's story is really interesting because he got a sort of a multifaceted screening program. He, he, he was biopsied before and did not find it. Is that right? That, that's correct. So, and, and that's not unusual. Bi biopsy is the gold standard, so to speak. It's the test that we, we make the treatment decisions based on, but it's also not perfect. You're taking a sampling of the prostate, 12 little hair size samples uh, of a prostate, um, and you may or may not get the right answer. And, and I think just a good case of that where, where there was a previous PSA testing, previous biopsies, and those did not reveal the cancer. The good news is usually that means that cancer is small, but I think it's good to know that there are additional tests that are available that can help lead us down the pathway to hopefully finding a cancer that may become a problem down the road. While for the most part, leaving most men alone um, that don't that have very low risk of having an, uh, an occult cancer. Got it. Um, I want a, a quick follow up, Dr. Waite, on that. Um, you know, Jeff shared his PSA levels, um, and they ranged over a period of over a decade, going from mm -hmm. two something to finally with the ISO PSA test, 10 point something. What do those numbers mean? You know, and I, I understand that it's also about the pattern, how quickly the numbers are escalating. Is that right? So, the, the PSA is, is a portion of a protein made only in the prostate. And, and this, val, this, this peptide gets into the bloodstream and can be identified on, on blood tests. The quote unquote normal level was zero to four. So anything under four historically has been considered normal. Um, part of what we understand now as time has gone on is that doesn't really make sense. You can have prostate cancer and have a PSA under four. Um, I've had patients with PSAs under one, but that's, a, that's quite rare. Also, it's important to know that most men with a PSA from four to 10 don't have prostate cancer. But as that PSA level goes up for the average man, the risk of prostate cancer goes up. But this is confounded by age and some ethnicity issues and differences. Uh, there are some genetic alterations that increase your PSA, as well as many benign things that make your PSA go up like like for example, a, a urinary tract infection or urinary retention, even something like having sex can temporarily make your PSA go up. So it's always important not to get too excited about one PSA, really more important the trend. And especially if there's a sudden change in that trend that's not proportionate to the normal rise that we see as all men age. Perfect, thank you, Dr. Waite. Um, you know, so Jeff, I want to go back to you now. Um, you know, we've come up to this point, you meet Dr. Waite, you go through another, you know, more tests and scans, um, and then you get the news. What do you remember about um, the diagnosis from that day? Well, because uh, I'm a big user of the my chart. Um, so once the results were out on my chart, I saw them and I began to Google you know, certain words and the results out there, malignant, this, that, and other, something. Okay, so 
that's what this work means. So this is what I'm looking forward to. So when Dr. Waite uh, came into the room, uh, the examination room that day, and he had the results in his hand, I already had an inkling what he was getting ready to tell me. Uh, and so he told me, he showed the results, and then I'm like, I, 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 I wasn't shocked. I, was, I guess I was shocked, but then again, I wasn't because I had seen the results in my chart record. And so he told me that I was like numb for a second. And then he began to go through the uh, recommendations of um, fixing it, uh, what have you. He, he said surgery was one, radiation was another one, uh, the, uh, the seas was another one. And then I think it was something, I think if I remember correctly, the focal uh, was another example of treatment. And, and you know, I was just sitting there, I said, you know, if I had to make a decision right now, we would just take out the prostate and be done with and move on with life. And so he said, well, just take a few days, uh, take some time to think about it. And then, you know, when you make that decision, call me back and we'll, we'll set up the set up whatever you, whatever your choices, um, whatever you decide to do. Mm -hmm. So, and so, um, and that was in February. So I think maybe two weeks later, two, maybe two, three weeks later, you know, I, was, uh, I, I, I had broken news to my family. And so one of the questions that came up from my family was, would you need to have radiation treatment? And I said, you know what? He talked to, didn't say anything about that, but I would go back to him and check. And so I began sending Dr. Uh, Wade and Dr. Motlin both same similar messages, but I have to have radiation treatment after this, that, and other. And so both of them came back and said, at this point, you were not, but you know, we have to find out what happened after the pathology comes back. And so I so when I kind of there and I said, you know what, I'm ready for it. I told Dr. Wade, I'm I'm ready for the, the surgery. Let's schedule it so I can get this behind me and we can move on with life. And so Great. And that was how you came to the decision. Actually, Jeff, really quickly, you know what, what I'm hearing from you is that you were you were like i just want to move forward um yeah. anything else you want to say about what went into the decision and it sounds like your family had an impact too um in terms of what they were concerned about for you well they, they, they were because all, I, my, all, um, all of my family is in alabama my mother sisters everybody's there i'm the only one who's out of state and so breaking that, that having that conversation it was a tough one so i started out with my sister who um is a breast cancer survivor and so she, we went she shared similar stories uh she told me about her story and i said you know what at, at this point we're going to remove it out and she said you're going to be fine and I, she says well i'm not sure how you're going to tell the rest of the family so i began slowly but surely breaking the news uh to my my brother and I told my older sister, and then finally I told my my mother, and she was having she was the most difficult one to tell. Uh, but in the meantime, when between all that was happening, I was looking online to see how this procedure was going to be done as such, and began to say, oh, you know, it's it's like one big come out. I'm not sure if I told you this, but I have a maternity brother who had a similar case like this nine years ago and he was telling me about his story that he has a huge scar in his stomach and this that, and another and so i began to like oh my god i have this huge scar in my stomach but then when i began looking at online and saw how the robotic surgery was being done it's like only five little scars two inches long maybe and you know and so that helped me a lot and just to see how it was going to be done and and i think of that there was an article from the mayo clinic that says hey you know you'll be down for maybe two or three weeks if you if you just doing sedentary type work, you may be up and operational within a week and a half. If not, you know, four weeks at most, uh, you may go back in uh, to have staples removed or whatever. And the staple wasn't there. You may have to wear a catheter for seven to 10 days. And even Dr. Wade told me about that as well. And so, I, you know, so that sort of put me at ease as to the process and the recovery uh, time. So that helped me in my decision. I did not like the, the radiation treatment. I did not like to see because I think I've um, either doctor doctor may have said that I may have read it that there may be a chance with the seeds it may come back again and I said I did not want to go through that cycle twice uh, and so and that's why I said go to the surgery and uh, and then when I mentioned it to my primary care and he said you know at your age surgery probably is the best thing just just take it out and be done with it and get the healing process done. Right. So you had a lot of different input. That's great. And you landed on the surgery. Um, Dr. Waite would love to hear from the medical sort of perspective. Well, yeah, what were the treatment options? It sounds like with prostate cancer, it's uh, it was localized for Jeff. Uh, so it wasn't advanced. It hadn't spread. Um, yeah. So what are the typical treatment options there? And how do you like to characterize it to your patients? Yeah, that's um, that. Th I think this is always a really challenging discussion because 
I'm, I'm amazed actually at how much Jeff understood because you have to transfer a lot of information across to this patient. And, and I would be interested to hear from you, Jeff, as well. On top of the shock of being diagnosed with cancer, now suddenly you're given four or five options of which many you don't have any experience. In. And I must, I always imagine it must feel overwhelming. Uh, and I, I would just be anxious to hear, I, I'll go through kind of my algorithm, but I'd be anxious to hear, Jeff, how that felt for you. And if it was made a little bit easier by getting a little peek ahead of time with my chart. Yes, it was overwhelming, but the my chart has sort of nuts in the below, if you will, uh, because I had a chance to Google some things in the, in the results and that and sort of ease my mind as it's supposed to, you know, not looking at it, not having any best knowledge of that. So it, it was overwhelming, but then again, it wasn't. And mm -hmm. the way you was explaining it to me that day, it's sort of, you know, these are your options. And, you know, if I was you, I would do this or whatever, but that, you know, but you left the decision up to me to make the final decision. And so, you know, I'm, you know, and, and I would rely heavily up on your decision, but I know the ultimate decision was mine to make. And so, yeah, but it, it, it was overwhelming, but again, the peaking of my chart sort of lessened the blow. And I, I think the, the second time I visited with you, I, I it, it really was getting to set it settled in with me. And I was getting ready to have a meltdown in the office, but you you let me to have my way. <laughs> uh, because at that point, it, it, the reality was setting in there because I really do have it. And I was really getting ready to have the surgery. And so the reality was getting to happen. And I began to have a like a meltdown in the office, a, a mini meltdown, but you, you let me have my way. And says so you again, uh, if you have any questions, feel free to give me a call back. So, yeah. Well, great. Um, yeah, thank you for sharing that. I, I, I think that um, the thing, the first thing I always try to communicate is just, just take a breath. And, and sometimes it may feel like life will never be the same, or you'll never be happier, and you'll never smile, and you'll never do the stuff you love to do again. And you take a breath, and then, and then let's talk about the options. Now, when I talk with my patients, I always like to, to generally say there are kind of four general categories. One is observation. And for actually a lot of prostate cancer, you can closely watch it and that's a safe treatment option. And it feels weird to patients where you say, what, I have cancer and, and we're just gonna not do anything about it. But we know early stage, small volume prostate cancer is very um, treatable by what we call active surveillance. It's close monitoring. And we know that 15 years later, almost all those men are still alive and at least half of them or more never got any treatment in those entire 15 years and are still doing okay. Um, but as you move up in the, the stages of, in the grades of prostate cancer, that becomes a less appropriate option um, unless you have really other competing comorbidities. So the first question always to be asked in my mind is should we treat this or not? And if the patient is young and healthy and if the the cancer is at least a grade group two or higher, generally the answer is yes. So then you move into the treatment options. And there are kind of, in my mind, three categories of treatments. One is radiation treatments, um, which Jeff referred to. And, and the common one is an external uh, beam radiation where you, you lie on a table and you get hit with a x-ray of some sort or some sort of energy force that, that delivers radiation to the prostate. The other type is seeds where you, you this is done in the operating room, you have small little rice size pieces of, uh, of uh, brachytherapy seeds that are placed into the prostate and those give off the radiation locally. But many of the side effects and many of the, the pros and the cons are similar between those two types of treatments. And then you have surgical treatments and uh, you know historically for 70 or 80 years, that was an open radical prostatectomy or a perineal prostatectomy, but where you made the bigger incision, which sounds like that's the one you'd heard about. Um, in the United States now, though, most surgery for prostate cancer is done robotically because the incisions are smaller and, and the total recovery is faster. The risk of needing a blood transfusion and a few other complications are lower. And that's where you remove the prostate and, and usually the nearby lymph nodes. And, and then the, the last category, which is an emerging category, is uh, focal therapy. And this is 
the idea behind focal therapy is that if you catch it early enough, you may be able to treat just one part of the prostate instead of the entire gland, which historically radiation and clearly removing it does. Um, this is a much smaller group of people that are eligible for this kind of treatment. And as our imaging gets a little better, as our biopsy techniques get better, and we get a little bit more confidence that we have identified the part of the prostate that's affected only, um, there may be some eligibility for focal therapy. And, and there are different types of focal therapy for prostate cancer. So those are kind of the general categories that I introduced to the patient. And then as we kind of consider their specific details, we kind of go down one, one pathway or another, or as we also consider their priorities and, and what makes sense to them. Thank you both for sharing. I also thought that tidbit about finding out on my chart was really interesting, Jeff, how that lessened the blow for you. Um, you know, Dr. Waite, going back to what you were just describing though, um, you know, Jeff described his situation as a Gleason score seven. Um, does that dictate the grading and, and do those numbers really inform which path is the best way? I know it has to do with the individual a lot as well. Um, and I also wanted to ask about, people are worried about the order uh, in which you might receive these treatments, one of the conceptions is uh, if you get radiation, then surgery is off the table for later, you know, these kinds of things. So the, the old scoring system for prostate cancer was a little bit confusing, and that was the sum of the two most common patterns seen in the prostate. So you could have a Gleason 7 that could be either a 3 plus 4 or a 4 plus 3. And, um, and in addition to add to the confusion, and those actually behave differently. So the four plus three behaves a little bit more aggressively than the three plus four in general. Uh, the other thing that was confusing to a lot of patients is the lowest grade prostate cancer was a six, but it doesn't feel like six is the lowest, right? It feels like it's on a scale of one to 10 and you're a six, you're like almost to the top, it feels like. And so we had a little bit harder time convincing patients, yeah, I know it's a six, but it's not that risky and they're, um, and so the new scoring system has shifted that kind of six to 10 system to a one to five system. And, and it's based on the same underlying patterns, but it's just, I think, a, a little bit more intuitive and it's easier to communicate to the patient. So um, on that scoring system that uh, the old scoring system, it was a seven, but it was a three plus four. So on the new scoring system, that becomes a two. Um, so that's where Jeff's cancer fell. And we generally like to leave ones alone and watch those closely. We may, if there's a high volume, we may consider some additional testing like genomics, which we take uh, the biopsy that was already done and we do some additional testing on that to see which genes are expressed or suppressed. And that pattern of expression has been associated with prostate cancer outcomes. Um, but in general, we, we like to use active surveillance for the lowest risk group. And then in the group two or higher, generally for the average person that has at least seven to 10 years of life expectancy, on average, that patient will benefit from treatment. Um, if, if they have less than seven to 10 years, then it's very unlikely for the average patient, except for the most aggressive kinds of prostate cancer, will benefit from treatment. And so observation may continue to be a good idea in that situation. And so sometimes in people who are older or who are sicker, we may extend the watching criteria to people who are even in grade group two or three. And, um, and you had another question. Yes, it's, about it. the, it's okay. Yeah, I asked you a lot. Uh, the order in which you might under, you know, undergo oh, a particular yes. treatment. Yeah. Yeah, so this one, this, this is a, a, a contentious topic sometimes among prostate cancer specialists, but um, th there is, it's easier to sequence surgery followed by radiation. So for good, the good news is for tumors like Jeff, most of the time one treatment is more than adequate and one treatment has a very high chance with a cancer specific survival on average, usually in the 90% range, meaning, if you take 100 people, 90 of them will still be alive from their cancer standpoint 10 years later. So that's good news. Um, but in the more aggressive tumors, you may need multiple treatments. You may need surgery and radiation and hormone therapy. Uh, and the sequencing is a little bit easier, a little bit lower risk surgery followed by radiation. 
You can do surgery after radiation, but it's a much higher risk proposition. Not very many surgeons do it because of the, the riskiness of it. And uh, the, I always <laughs> like to compare it to making a grilled cheese sandwich. Um, it's way easier to take the cheese out before you grill the sandwich than to take it out after you've grilled it. And so surgery just is a, a simpler, lower risk um, option uh, if, it, if there has not been any radiation. Thank you for laying that out. Um, and I think it's interesting that even among specialists, there's you know, some areas still where there's debate, um, still a lot of medical different opinions, right? Um, so, so Jeff, I'm curious, after, you know, at this point, um, you know, Dr. Waits presented all the options, um, and I know you did a lot of your own research, Dr. Google pops up quite often nowadays, but how much did you feel like you wanted to rely on Dr. Waits' opinion versus your own? Like, how, you know, how, were you confident in being able to make the decision more on your own after getting this information? Well, um... I guess it was a combination because as, as Dr. Wake gave me the diagnosis that day and he says, you know, he told me about his story about his dad um, was my age when he was diagnosed and he lived a very productive life after that. And, you know, he, considering your age, you know, you, you, you live a similar lifestyle as well. And then between that and my research um, online and, and that helped me make the decision. So it, it maybe a combination of the two. And, and on that note, Jeff, we talked a little bit about this earlier um, before we started recording, but, you know, oftentimes patients feel the need to be, say, quote, a good patient. And, and I think you gave a great example that showed sort of the relationship that uh, you and Dr. Waite would have. Can you talk about that? After I broke the news to my, uh, my sister, who is a, like the, the breast cancer survivor, and she was asking me, do I need radiation treatment? Then, you know, I began reaching out to both Dr. Waite and Dr. Marlin, asking them the same questions. And, you know, and they, if they, in my mind, they weren't responding within the two days or the three days that they were saying, I was getting nervous and getting nervous. And finally, I reached out to one of his nurses in the triage area. And she said, you know what, it's probably best that you come in to see Dr. Waite and, and ask us question of him. And so when I got in there and I talked to him, he answered my question, I said, again, if I feel like I've been a pest, I do apologize. And he says, you're not been a pest. He said, but again, he said, you know, just feel free to ask any question you may have. He says, you know, this is all, you know, just feel comfortable asking me a question. But I felt like because I was going in two different directions, I was bothering both him and Dr. Marlin by my question. But he, he, he gave me some reassurance. He said, you're not been a pest. He says, just feel free to ask any questions that you may have. And, you know, if you, after today, if you've got any more questions, just reach back out to me and we'll be more than happy uh, to answer your questions. And in fact, uh, I think Dr. Motley has said, he says, Dr. Wake has the highest bedside manner that he can recommend me um, in, in, this, in this area here. So that, that sort of eased me down, that sort of settled me down uh, some as well. Yeah, I'm not bothering him. Just ask the question. If, if you have something tonight, tomorrow, whenever, just feel free to ask any questions you may have. Uh, and I, I felt comfortable with him uh, that day. That yeah, just really put me at ease. Yeah. And one more thing about that, when Dr. Waite shared with you such a personal tidbit, you know, that his father had been diagnosed uh, with prostate cancer and, you know, gave you more of that personal, um, you know, bit of information. How did that impact you? How did that help help you? It did, it did, as I am I'm not told you, I may have told you this before, but I'm a man of faith and believe in God. And so with that, his father lived a very productive life. Then speaking to my fraternity brother, who was my age, not eight years ago, had a similar surgery. Hearing that news made me feel, hey, there, this is not the end of the world. There's still time left to go forward. And so I, and that sort of, you know, sort of helped me make the decision and said, you know, things are going to be okay. And then after I talked to my sister, who was a minister, she also said, hey, you know God, God knows you. And so you're going to make, you're going to survive through this whole process. And so that too, uh, you know, it sort of settled me down a bit because after, after, after I got that initial news and sort of subconsciously, I think I was still on the edge. Uh, <laughs> uh, but I guess that's to be expected. But I was subconsciously, I was still on the edge. I didn't sleep very well for a couple of days after that. And, and then the closer I got to the surgery is even more sleepless nights and what have you. And, but, you know, I, mean, I guess that's to be expected. I had. Definitely. I mean, you just get so overwhelmed with this news. I don't expect anything otherwise. Um, thank you for sharing that, Jeff. Um, Dr. Waite, speaking about the questions, you know, and I know you you get you gave Jeff that reassurance. Ask whatever you need. Um, 
I know it depends on the person, but a sort of a two-parter here. One, what are some of the most important questions you think patients should be asking? Um, you know, at this point, uh, whether it's about treatment or, or what have you, and then um, we'll we'll start with that, and then I'll ask you the next. <laughs> I think it's important uh, to. It's a, it's actually a hard process to become an empowered patient. I think we're not used to it. We're not good at it. We don't have the experience generally, especially if this is your first, so to speak, rodeo in in the medical specialty uh, or, or in the medical field. And I, I've thought a lot, you know, how do we help patients get there? I think, I think the patient should really feel um, like they are in the driver's seat. And that's hard to do because when you get diagnosed with cancer, it feels like everything's out of control and everything's happening to you and people are making predictions about your life and you feel like you don't have any control. But I think it's important to remember that you do. And, and I, I really like what Jeff did is he got multiple opinions and he sought multiple sources. And I think that helps you to start to feel some degree of control when you start to hear similar stories from your primary care doctor, from you know one or two specialists, which I think is a good idea to visit with. I mean, I usually encourage my patients to get another opinion, at least with a radiation doctor. So you really start to hear a lot of opinions and you start to feel empowered that you're the one that's going to make the decision and that meets your goals and your your needs the most and i think that's the that's one of the hardest hurdles to get over but you should as a patient recently diagnosed with cancer you should feel empowered to say hey i i am the one that's driving my priorities are the ones that matter i'm going to try to get all the information i can so i can make the decision that helps me meet my priorities and goals, because they may be different from your doctors. And I think that's important to realize. Yeah, no, absolutely. Those are great points um, to consider. Um, Dr. Waite, one more follow-up here. You know, speaking of questions um, and, and the patient, I know with prostate cancer, it's really about the individual. Jeff, you know, 59 diagnosis, young, um, healthy otherwise, um, you know, a black man. And so wanted to ask you about what you know factors to consider for people too, um, and I know with uh, about genomics and mutations, um, you know we don't know if if his sister with breast cancer had BRCA one or two or anything like that. But how important is it to to, to have this kind of information and for pa patients to to be able to ask the right questions? I think we're still learning how to apply all of these other details. And I think it's an exciting time. I think we're gonna to get to the point where we can really approach individualized medicine. We still do a lot of population-based medicine where we take people and we try to put them into the most, the smallest groups possible, but we, we still make these determinations based on the, the average black man or the average white man or the average guy who's 59. Um, or the average genomic score, uh, for example. Uh, and I think we're still trying to learn, and I think there are lots of opportunities both with the genomics, but also with the aid of artificial intelligence and decision um, trees and, and, and prognostic models, where we're gonna get even better at, at helping give patients information that will be more specific to them. And, and I think that's exciting, but it's also frustrating because right now it may feel like a smorgasbord of information that's just swirling around and you're like, how do I make sense of this? I've got to make some decision and move forward. And, um, but, but I, think, I think we're making progress here and, and we continue to get little pieces here and there that give us more information on how to make better decisions for patients as they face this cancer. Absolutely, thank you for that. Um, Jeff, on that note, I know you mentioned um, you have a younger brother, a couple years younger than you. Um, and we, we know from some statistics that, you know, if you have a father or brother with prostate cancer, you, you're more likely um, to, to get prostate cancer to have it. So I would love to hear from you. You said you were gonna talk to him. Um, can you tell, tell us a little bit more about the conversation that you think is important to have? Probably the most important one is be, get yourself checked. Um, the quicker, the better. Um, sorry, my dog is my puppy is here with me right now. So, uh, but yeah, the sooner the better. Um, be quiet. The sooner the better. The, you, the better off you will be. And and so if there is if there is a presence of cancer, you can get it treated quicker, quickly, and get it uh, taken care of versus waiting until later because 
men of color tend not to go to the doctors a lot. And if they do so, it's always at the ninth hour. And so the sooner you can get it uh, checked and get uh, tested or what have you, the better off you will be. And so that would be my conversation with him or any man, any man of color um, to get checked and get checked quicker and timely and, and, and more and more frequently. Yeah. Wonderful. It's such an important conversation to have. Um, I know it's okay with your doc. We love, you know, these Zoom conversations. It's part of life now. Uh, you, ha you have to have some interruption. Um, but Jeff, just to follow up, your last, my last question to you is, I know you talked about the Al Roker story. I was, you know, fortunate enough to talk to him. The importance of seeing people like yourself especially those maybe in the public eye, but just to get that um, you know, presence out there. What's the importance of having people share their stories, people like you, um, to make sure that other people are hearing that message of what you were talking about, getting screened earlier um, and just taking better care of their health? Again, the, the awareness, because a lot of times we don't know what we don't know. And so if you have a situation going on with inside of your body, um, the more you know about it, the better off you are. Uh, a case in point, I was uh, a few years ago when I was going to the my new minority men's health fair, I felt a little guilty because if I have health insurance and I'm taking up a space for someone who does not have health insurance. Then after speaking to the director of that, he says, no, don't ever feel that way. If they see you are more interested in your health conditions, that would probably inspire others to do the same thing. And so I, I, sort of, I sort of changed my thought process on that. And, um, and so now that I've been diagnosed with this prostate cancer, more people need to become more aware of their bodies and taking an interest in, 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 in care for themselves. You know, I, I feel like I've lived at Cleveland Clinic now between my primary care physician, my urologist, my cardiologist, my this and this and this. I feel like I've got the whole body covered now because of everything that's happening. <laughs> but again, the more I know about my bodies and what's happening with it, the better I, I, I am. Um, and, and so Dr. Wade, I'll give you the last question. Um, What's your last message to patients too about the, and, and maybe to doctors too, but it's about the importance of people sharing and, and also people listening. I'm really grateful to Jeff for coming on and sharing your story because it's, it's, not, it's not easy to do sometimes. And especially sometimes with prostate cancer, people have some, sometimes some funny ideas about prostate cancer, but I think, I think it is so valuable to share stories. I think we're good at sharing the numbers and sharing the mechanism of treatment and, and how to navigate through it. But um, that's the, the whole reason we do that is so we can have life. And I think that, you know, when people can see Jeff now, he's gone through his treatment, you know, he's still smiling, he's still doing stuff with his dog, he's still living life. I think that's really valuable. And knowing how to negotiate that. It helps people see that there is something up there ahead when, when maybe all you can see is that diagnosis initially. So I'm really grateful, Jeff, for you to doing this with us and sharing your story. And, and I think we as doctors, or my message I think to doctors would be, we need to listen to this aspect of the story because this helps us to understand this helps us to select which treatment maybe is the best. And, and we need to really listen to what do our patients value? What do they care about most? Um, you know, one of the questions I ask is sometimes as doctors, we get stuck on thinking about how to improve the survival of the patient, right? That we get focused on the survival, especially cancer specific survival. That's our wheelhouse. And, and sometimes we forget, we think about the cancer and we forget about the patient who has the cancer. And so I think I would just encourage doctors to, to, to listen to what the patient is saying, what they value, what they care about, where they want to go. And, um, and then we can help choose and help them choose the treatments that help them to meet those, those goals. And I really also appreciate what Jeff said about some of the disparities in, in prostate cancer, because they're, they're marked in the United States. And it's interesting, we've we're beginning to dig into the, why this is. We know that African-American men are more likely to get prostate cancer. And when they get it, they're almost twice as likely to die from it. And there's been a lot of you know, proposed theories as to why that is, but most of the uh, uh, recent data suggests it's largely due to 
uh, non-biological related things. A lot of people have thought maybe it was all due to different genetics between African-Americans and Caucasians, but the genetics seem to play actually a fairly slim role overall. It's more, more likely due to lower insurance rates among African-Americans, lower access to care, uh, lower education uh, about these topics. And so I think these kinds of things are really helpful to help us begin to overcome these things. Because if, if people listen to Jeff, you know, and, and go out and, and get screened and be active participants in their health care, I think we will be able to shrink those discrepancies. And if we do things on a society level, like improve the amount of an, a number of people insured and, and improve, you know, educational outreach, that I think we can start to, to narrow these discrepancies. And that is so powerful. Thank you so much, Dr. Waite, for, for sharing that. I couldn't agree with you more um, as a former patient. And Jeff, I second what Dr. Waite said. You know, you coming on here, sharing your story, so powerful, and I know will make such a big impact. And so I appreciate uh, that Dr. Waite helped connect us. Um, so thank you both and, um, you know, for this conversation with Dr. Chris Waite at Cleveland Clinic and with Jeff, uh, who came on and shared his very powerful perspective, uh, you can find the conversation at thepatientstory.com, where we provide human answers to your cancer questions. Mm -hmm.